This is our study for the first eight Sundays of the year. In fact, this is our theme uh, for the entire year where we are challenging you to press into the things of God, to press into the kingdom of God, to press into all that God uh, wants you to be. Someone say press. press. Now we have, uh, deci- we have defined the kingdom of God as God's alternative civilization amid the world's fallen civilization ruled by his reign, his presence, and his order. This is kind of the definition uh, that we have given uh, to you to think about, to start to process uh, this definition of God's alternative civilization amid the world's fallen civilization uh, ruled by his reign, his his presence and order. Now, re- I want to remind you that um, no one definition can contain all that is in the kingdom of God because the kingdom of God is too powerful and it is too vast. But we are learning that the kingdom of God is everything we need for life and godliness. Remember that? Everything we need for life and godliness is in the kingdom of God. And we are learning that the kingdom of God is God's total answer for man's total need. That, that's why we're stressing the kingdom of God. That's why we're learning about the kingdom of God. And we also learned that in the kingdom of God are many rooms uh, and in each room is an aspect of your inheritance to be uh, possessed, right? That, that we are to pr- press in to our inheritance. You are not to live your life in the lobby of the kingdom, but you are to sometimes even break down a door uh, in the kingdom of God and possess what is rightfully yours. Amen. We have also learned that in the kingdom of God are multiple floors to be conquered, right? There are multiple levels in the kingdom of God to be conquered. And in each level is new dimensions of your inheritance to be experienced, right? So we not only press forward, we also press upwards into the kingdom of God and experience new levels of joy, new levels of peace, new levels of your calling here Uh, in this world. Now, um, I want to remind us that as children of God, we have an inheritance from God that we are to press into and that we are to possess. You have an inheritance. We have an inheritance. In fact, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 12, I'm going to put it up on the screen. Uh, It says, the apostle says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Now you might say, I'm not worthy for the kingdom of God. I'm not worthy for the Lord to bless me. Well, you are absolutely right. You are not worthy. We are not worthy. But thank God for the Lord Jesus Christ, who makes us worthy by his shed blood on Calvary, And he gave us his righteousness. We gave him our sin. He gave us his righteousness so that we might inherit the kingdom of God. And now he has qualified us. You got good news. I got good news for y'all today. You may not qualify for good credit, but you qualify for the kingdom of God. Hello, somebody. I don't know why I said that because some of y'all probably discouraged. Maybe you got a letter. But let me tell you something. You qualify for the inheritance in the kingdom of God. And it's yours. Now, listen, your inheritance is not going to be easily possessed. It's not going to be easily attainable. That's why we're challenging you to press in to the kingdom of God. Now, you might say, well, what is this deal about inheritance? What does it cover? What do you, what do you mean by inheritance? Well, let me summarize what your inheritance is. Your inheritance covers three aspects. It, it covers all that God wants you to be, all that God wants you to do, and all that God wants you to have, all right? Are you, are you following along? Your inheritance that God has for you covers everything that he wants you to be, all that he wants you to do, and all that he wants you to have in this world. Now, I do want to say this. Don't get so caught up in all that God wants you to have. Too many Christians get caught up in, in what they want to have. Listen, that is a benefit in the kingdom of God. You are to have certain things. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. But listen, who God wants you to be is more important than what God wants you to have. 
Who God wants you to become is more important than what God wants you to have. If you will focus on what God wants you to be, all the have will follow through. Yeah. Are you picking up what I'm putting down? So you got to press into uh, uh, the kingdom of God, press into your inheritance. And how many have learned that there are obstacles? How many have learned that already? That there are, there are obstacles that get in our way. Listen, there are obstacles between us and who God wants us to be. There are obstacles between us and what God wants us to do uh, in this world. There are obstacles. If you don't know that already, I'm letting you know in advance that in 2019, you are going to be confronted with some obstacles that are going to try to hinder you, distract you, and divert you from being all that God has called you to be in 2019. But thanks be to God. He gives us the strength and the wisdom to discern the obstacles and to press, 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 press. Someone say press to press through some things in life. I, I want to praise God for our women's conference that happened yesterday. Amen. Let me show you let me show you a little bit about what happened at our women's conference, man. There was hundreds and hundreds of ladies that converged upon a chapel of change, but more importantly, the Holy Spirit, man, was with us and the power of God was with us. I met some ladies from Antelope Valley. I met some ladies from San Diego. I even met some lady from Fresno, California that came and experienced what God is doing uh, at Chapel of Change. Hundreds and hundreds of women came yesterday and, and were inspired to answer yes to the question of the Lord when he says, do you want to become whole? Amen. And we're pressing into wholeness uh, uh, at Chapel of Change. I, uh, last Friday, I was um, in my office and I got a phone call from this lady at downtown uh, LA and she asked me, she said, Brian, I heard about your women's conference this Saturday and I work at downtown LA and she says, listen, I have not registered yet, but I wanna know if it's still okay if I can, if I can attend the women's conference. And I told her, I said, listen, um, everybody is welcome to attend the women's conference, but because so many people have registered, I cannot guarantee you to have a seat. Can't guarantee it, you're welcome to come. You're welcome to come, but I can't guarantee you to have a seat because so many people have registered. And you know what? Uh, there was a quiet on the phone. And then all of a sudden, the sister says to me, she said, well, she said, is it possible for me to bring my own seat? And I thought for a second, I said, well, you know, I, I was like, man, that's kind of weird, right? But then I thought, man, that's our theme for the year, right? That's exactly what I, that's exactly what we've been preaching on, exactly what we've been teaching on. Listen, let me tell you something. Sometimes there's going to be obstacles in your way, but there's sometimes you got to bring your own seat. Sometimes you got to bring your own seat to the party, amen? Because when God shows up, you need to bring your own seat. Touch your neighbor and say, bring your own seat. Now, we have been studying about the kingdom of God and want to kind of remind us that the concept of the kingdom of God is not a new concept. This is not a new concept. In fact, uh, it does not start in the New Testament. You could trace the kingdom of God all the way back to Genesis. And I need to, in our study this morning, to take us back to Genesis uh, chapter 1 and 2 so that we could see how the kingdom of God was launched, how we could see how it was launched. And for a subtopic this morning, um, we are going to be dealing with the kingdom launched. The kingdom launched. Someone say kingdom launched. Now, it's important, my brothers and sisters, for us to understand the original purpose of God's plan for man and creation. Very, very important for us to understand God's original plan for man and creation. Now, as we go through our study this morning, I want to give you this principle to kind of keep in the back of your mind and to kind of think through as we learn about the kingdom of uh, uh, launch. And this is the principle that I want to kind of present to you. And that is, I'm going to put it up on the screen, that if you don't know, if we don't know what's supposed to be, we won't know what's missing. I want to give this principle. Think about this principle as we study this morning. I want you to keep this running in the back of your mind. If we don't know what's supposed to be, we won't know what's missing. Now, my brothers and sisters, it is possible to be robbed and not even know it. It's possible to be robbed and not even know it. It's possible to be walking around with a smile on your face and all the time you've been robbed because you don't know what's supposed to be. Are you picking up what I'm putting down? 
we could be robbed and don't even know it if you don't know how your life is supposed to be. And so I want, to, I want you to keep this principle in your mind that if we don't know what's supposed to be, we won't know what's what, what's missing? Because a lot of people, even Christians, are walking around saved, but they're walking around robbed. Ain't nothing worse like a robbed Christian, right? And I want to remind us that the Bible is God's original blueprint for the way that our lives are supposed to be, right? The Bible, this Bible, this inspired word of God is our original blueprint for how our life is supposed to be. This is the original blueprint for God's purpose for our life. Are you picking up what I'm putting down? Now let's turn back to Genesis. We need to go back to Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2 and see how the kingdom of God was originally launched uh, so that we could see how it's supposed to be. Now, as we study, you need to know that the plot line for the kingdom of God is found in Genesis 1, Genesis 2, and Genesis chapter 3. I'm not going to read this entire three chapters this morning, but I'm going to read some portions of it to kind of set up our reflection and our meditation for us uh, this morning. But I want to encourage you on your own to go back and read Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2, and Genesis chapter 3. Uh, I invite you right now to turn to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, and I'm going to read quite a few uh, scriptures, and I want you to follow along in your mind uh, as I read the scripture. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, when everybody's there, say amen. amen. Listen to this. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion. Someone say dominion dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creepy thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. Someone say image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. Then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion. Someone say dominion. Dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth. I want you to skip uh, to chapter 2, verse 8. Chapter 2, verse 8. When everybody's there, say amen. All right, 2, verse 8. Let's pick up like this. Then God planted a garden. Someone say garden. garden. Garden eastward in Eden on the east side of Eden. Y'all didn't catch that. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Skip down to verse 15. Skip down to verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden. Someone say garden. garden. The garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. And the Lord commanded the man saying of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Someone say die. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man shall be alone. And every man of the house said, amen. amen. Oh, y'all didn't say it like you believed it. Yeah. Amen. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground of the uh, ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But Adam, but for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. Notice the creativity of Adam. He's naming everything in the world. That's part of the image of God coming to bear. The image of God deals with creativity. We, we serve a creative God. He is creator. Hello, somebody. Right? And so Adam, he has the, the wisdom and the creativity. He's naming everything. Listen, man, it's hard enough for me to name three babies. Anybody remember having a kid? They give you a book. 
And you got all these names, what it means in the Hebrew, what it means in the Greek, and what it means in all that, and some of us still messed up. But Adam, he had this creativity about himself. Look at verse 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. Just want to remind you and I want you to notice that he brings, he brings woman out of the side of Adam, out of the side. Why the side? Because man and woman are to be co-laborers together with God. They are to be part Partners for the glory of God. He doesn't bring the woman out of here, out of man's feet so that man can rule over the woman and dominate the woman and step on the woman. But he also doesn't bring the woman out of his head uh, so that the woman can trample over the man, right? That's disorder. He brings that out of the side of man so that you two become one for the glory of God. Are you picking up what I'm putting down? All right, listen to this. Verse 23. And Adam said... This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So he sings a song and he, get, he, he starts to dance. <laughs> Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And every parent in the house said, Amen. Yeah. Oh, y'all didn't, didn't catch that right there. Last verse, 25. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. One of the most powerful phrases in the entire Bible. Not ashamed. My brothers and sisters, I want to pull out some reflections out of this text that kind of reminds us of how things are supposed to be. To remind us of things uh, that are supposed to be. Now remember, we're studying about the kingdom launched. And I got two major reflections. We're going to go back up to number one. The first thing that I want you to realize is that we were created for royal rule. We were created for royal rule. Some say royal rule. I want you to notice two things in this first verse that we study that is very powerful. Look what the verse says. It says, then God said, let us make man in our image According to our likeness, let them have dominion. Dominion. Now, my brothers and sisters, in this one verse is a powerful verse right here. This is a powerful verse that kind of tells us our potential. It tells us what, who we were called to be, who were we, we were created to be. Now, I want you to remember that when you deal with God, you're dealing with a king. Remember, we've been studying that for the last month or so, that God is not a mayor. He's not a governor. God is not even a president. God is the king of the universe. He is the king of creation. And I want you to notice our divine design that God creates us in his image. Someone say image. I want you to notice our divine design that God creates us in his own image. We are the only part of creation that is created in the image of God. When you go back to Genesis chapter 1 and you see how God created the animals, all the animals were created after their own likeness, after their own likeness. But when God went to create you and I, he broke the pattern and he said, no, I'm not creating them like a dog. I'm not creating them like a donkey i'm not creating them like a you know something else i'm creating them in my own image are you following along now the truth the truth about being created in the image of god is so so deep so so deep that i want to let you know we still don't even understand all that it means it is a deep deep revelation uh, in the kingdom of God. But the reality is the Bible teaches that we are created in God's image. In Genesis 9, 6, it further reinforces it that says, for in the image of God has God made mankind. Now, this truth is so deep that we don't totally understand it, but there are some things we do understand about the image of God. One of the things I want to point out to you that we do understand is that when God went to create us in his image, what he's doing is he's placing his own stamp on us. He is stamping us with him 
himself. That's one of the things that it means to be created in the image of God. That God placed his own personal self as a stamp onto mankind. I don't know if you know this already, but you've been stamped. Touch your neighbor and say, you've been stamped. Now, the, the, the things pertaining to God as a ruler has been stamped into the heart of mankind. Right. The things pertaining to God as a ruler have been stamped onto the heart of mankind. His royal image has been stamped upon us. And one of the things I really, really want to kind of kind of kind of dig deep in is that all of us as mankind were chosen to be God's royal representatives in this world. Our original assignment in this world included to be royal representatives of God in this earth. That's powerful. That's powerful. So when you, when you kind of get the revelation that you were, you were born to be a royal representative, then the question is asked, are you repping God well? Are you repping God well? Are you repping the kingdom of God well because you have been stacked? with the royal image of God on side of you. See, the reason why the enemy don't want you to think in terms of royalty, because if he could stop you to think in, of thinking in, in terms of royalty, then he can stop you from acting in ways of royalty. If he can stop you to think, stop you from thinking in ways of royalty, then he'll stop you from acting like your royalty. Are you following along? Now, I want you to also notice that he not only creates us in the image of God, but he also uh, gives us, this is divine delegation now. Look at what he gives us. He says, let them, let them have dominion. There's power in this one little phrase. He says, let them have dominion. This is divine delegation. He's, he's giving us a power. He's given us rule. And this word dominion, someone say dominion. Uh, there's lots of different words to capture what this means. I want to kind of summarize it just a little bit. The word dominion means royal rule. It means royal authority. Dominion means royal rule, royal authority. This is what God did when he originally launched his kingdom on earth. He gave mankind royal rule, royal authority. And as God was to rule in heaven, man was to rule on earth. See, see, God wanted to rule this world through you and I. He wanted to rule this world through you and I. We were not created to be slaves of anything in this world. We were created with royal rule. We were created with royal authority. You were not born to be ruled. You were born to rule. I want you to catch this. You were not born to be ruled. You were born to rule. So what are the, what are the basic implications of this? Well, we shouldn't be ruled by drugs. We shouldn't be ruled by alcohol. We shouldn't be ruled by depression. We shouldn't be ruled by discouragement. We shouldn't be ruled by anything in this world. We shouldn't be ruled by sin. Uh, Romans talks about sin shall not have no dominion over us. We should not be ruled. So, so what do you, so what do you get in that? Well, if you examine your knife right now, if you're ruled by anything, that's not how it's supposed to be. If you're ruled by prescription uh, uh, drugs, that's not how it's supposed to be. If you're ruled by alcohol, that's not how it's supposed to be. You're not born to be ruled, but you're born to rule. You have royal rule. God giving you royal authority. If you don't start thinking in terms of, of royalty, you won't start acting in terms of royalty. Are you following along? Let me show you Romans chapter 5 verse 17, one of the most powerful verses. Romans 5, 17, listen to this. It says, for those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness, that's you and I, that's you and I, reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. I want you to notice, it doesn't say reign in heaven. It doesn't say reign in heaven. Yes, there's going to come a time where the kingdom of God comes to full bear and we receive the totality of our, our inheritance when we get to that place uh, called heaven. But there is an element of your royal rule that should be exercised in this earth right now. And it's called, you are to reign in life through who? The one man, Jesus Christ. 
Jesus didn't just call you to save you. He called you so that you could rule and extend his glory in this world. We, we see a lot of these examples in the life of Jesus. When you study uh, the ministry of Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you see a lot of this example where he, where he demonstrates the power of the kingdom, not just to save people, but to empower them to rule. Uh, one of the examples that I see is in Mark chapter 2, verse 10. You don't have to turn there, but there's this man who was a paralyzed man, and he was confined to a bed. He was confined to a bed, and they would move him around on this bed, and they couldn't get to Jesus because the house was filled with people. So they put the guy on the bed, and they lifted them on the roof right and they tear the roof off of the situation that Jesus was in and they lower this guy on the bed right in front of Jesus and instead of Jesus getting mad he says man this guy is pressing in that's a whole new level of pressing in don't get any ideas you could come through the front door don't come through the uh, ceiling right but Jesus is like man this guy is pressing in I gotta honor his faith and Jesus meets his determination with his deliverance meets his faith with his freedom and you know what Jesus says in Mark chapter 2 verse 10 this is what he says Get this, get this. He says, he says, man, arise, take up your bed and go home. That's what he says in Mark chapter 2, verse 10. He says, he says get up, um, take up your bed and go home. I want you to notice something. I want you to notice something. He doesn't just say go home. You know what he says? He says, take up your bed. He says, take up your bed. What do you mean by that? Take up my bed. Yeah. I don't want to just save you. I want to empower you. I want, you to, I want to empower you to lift up that thing that was lifting up you. I want to empower you to rule that thing that was ruling you. I want to empower you to take charge of your life. I don't want to just send you home. I want you to go home with that bed. Pick up that bed. Go home. That's an example of ruling. Ruling. Why? Because we were created with royal rule. Here's another one that I see in the text is we were created uh, for royal environment. Someone say environment. We were created for royal environment. I want to I want to point out different elements of the environment that God created when he first launched uh, the kingdom of God, because environment is powerful. If the enemy got you in the wrong environment, he can sap you of your strength. He could sap you of your faith. In fact, I would suggest to you that some of you are in the wrong environment, and that is the reason why you don't feel like getting up in the morning. You could be in the wrong environment, and it's so bad, you don't feel like getting up in the morning. You don't feel like brushing your teeth. Why? Because you're in the wrong environment. You don't even realize that. And it's sapping you of your faith, sapping of you of your hope. You need to be reminded, man, we were created for royal environment. Listen to this. I want to highlight some of the elements. The first thing I want you to notice is that God places man in a garden. Someone say garden. garden. Genesis 2, 2, 8 says, The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Now, when I think of garden, my mind goes to tomatoes. My mind goes to lettuce. When I think of garden... My mind starts to think of my mother-in-law in the backyard in the dirt. But that's not the type of garden that God was talking about in Genesis 2. And let me just kind of expand your thinking for a second. When we go to study the Bible, we err when we try to look at the Bible through our 2019 minds. There's what you call in studying the Bible, um, context determines meaning. Context determines meaning. So when you go to the, to the Bible, you have to dig, undig the, the, the context of the scripture that it was written in. And one of the levels of, of context is the historical setting. In other words, you got to look at that scripture to the way they saw it. What did it mean to them? Not to you. Here's a, here's a mistake that a lot of people make when they approach the Bible. The first question they ask is, what does it mean to me? That's not the first question that you ask when you approach the Bible. That's a mistake. That question will come in your study, but the first question you got to ask is, what did this mean to them at that particular time? Are you picking up what I'm putting down? 
So when you think of garden, you think of tomatoes, you think of lettuces, you think of, you know, eating right. That's not exactly what this garden is about. In the ancient world, gardens were for kings. In the ancient world, not everybody had a garden. In the ancient world, gardens were for kings. So the garden in Eden, get this, my brothers and sisters, is a kingly image. It is a royal image. And we see in the garden a picture of the kingdom of God. It is a kingly image. It is a royal image. And it, it means or it reinforces the image that God created. Get this. Adam and Eve to be a king and a queen on this earth. Y'all didn't catch that. Y'all didn't catch it. When we see a garden in Genesis, this sets the scene. For Adam and Eve to be a king and a queen on this earth. For they were created for royal environments. So you mean, so you mean, so, so what do you mean? What do you mean? You mean to tell me all this time I was supposed to be a king and a queen? Yes. Yes, yes, and the devil doesn't want you to know it. He doesn't want you to know it because remember, if he could stop you from thinking in terms of royalty, he could stop you from acting in terms of royalty and enjoying the benefits of royalty. If he could stop you from thinking in terms of royalty, listen. Remember our, our original kind of principle that I gave you. If you don't know how it's supposed to be, you won't know what's missing. When the scripture calls Jesus the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, who do you think them other kings are? It includes, it includes you and I. It includes you and I. Listen, Revelation chapter 1 verse 6 says Jesus has made us kings and priests. That's a whole different other subject for another time. You mean to tell me I'm a priest too? Yes. So stop acting like that. Kings and priests unto God and his father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Paul says in 2 Timothy 2.15 that we will reign with Jesus. You were born to be a king. You were born to be a queen. You got to know this. This is, this is the mentality of the kingdom. Now let me, let, me, let me highlight other aspects of the environment God created us for. Because remember, environment is powerful. And I'm just going to highlight a couple layers of this environment. I'm going to put it up on the screen. Uh, look at what God uh, says about this environment. Number one is if there's life without death. Did you know that they weren't eating meat back then? I know I didn't like it either. Right? It's life without death. Did you know in the creation, when you study Genesis chapter 1 and 2, uh, roughly around seven times when there's this reframe that you hear over and over again, it's all good, it's all good, it's good, it's good. God did this, it's good. God created this, it's good, it's good. If your life is all bad right now, something is wrong. If your life is all bad right now, something is wrong. There is an answer, there's a solution, it's called the kingdom of God. It says it's all good. When you study Genesis 1 and 2, it's a, the presence of God is available for us. The presence of the king is available for us. All that we need is in the presence of God. And in the kingdom of God, the presence of the king is there. You ain't got to send him an email. You ain't got to talk to a secretary. It is there for you. And then one of the most powerful verses in the Bible are the end of Genesis um, chapter 2, I believe. It says that they were naked and not ashamed. This speaks more of than their physical kind of quality. No, it speaks about their spiritual makeup, that they had no shame and there was nothing to hide. Wow. 
The kingdom of God wipes away our shame. It wipes away our guilt. And when you live in the kingdom of God, there is nothing to hide because you're fully known and fully loved by the king. Listen, you got to understand how powerful this is. You know how much energy we spend on cover up things? You know how much we buy apps that cover up things. They got to spend money to cover up things. In the kingdom of God, there's no shame and nothing to hide. That's what the kingdom of God offers. Wipes away our guilt. Wipes away our shame. Wipes away all that that is dragging us all down. And then in the kingdom of God, when you study Genesis 1-2, there's order without chaos. Order without chaos. There's order. There's order. There's no chaos. There's no stress. We don't, we're not pulling out our hair, right? We're not, our hair's not even getting gray. There's order without chaos. Look at the beautiful environment that God created for us to enjoy and us to have as kings and queens in the kingdom of God. Life without death is all good. The presence of God, no shame and nothing to hide and order without chaos. If your life is the opposite of this right now, there is something wrong and we want to remind you that the kingdom of God is available to you to save you, to deliver you, and to help you reign in this life. I remember it was about, I think it was about, about 10 years into my prison experience and I still didn't know when I was going to go home. I had about six years left to do, but didn't know it at that time. And it was about four in the evening and I was laying down taking a nap and I heard it over the intercom. They yelled out, chow time, chow time. That means it's time to go eat. And... I got up off of my bed, and in prison, in chow time, when you go to eat, I was in a dorm with about 400 people. They all heard together, and they began to walk to the dining area. And so I remember I was kind of heard it with everybody, and I began to walk with them to the chow hall. And before I could even go downstairs, I started to hear a, a man getting clocked in the head with a, with a lock in a sock. I just started hearing a grown man scream, ah, ah, and then just lack, lack, lack. And they, they knock him out and they drag him away. And I'm just, I'm just coming out of like a nap and I'm just seeing all this. Nobody can do nothing. You can't do nothing. You just gotta kinda like accept it because that's the type of environment that that was in. But I'll never forget after, I'll never forget after I saw what happened to him, I kinda broke away from the, I broke away from the group and I sat down on one of the tables and I, and I kinda put my head down on my, my knees and I had this epitome, man. I had this epitome. I had this awakening of my soul and I'll never forget. I said to myself, I said, man, I am not born for this environment. I had this awakening. I had this epitome where I came to myself. I said, man, I'm not created for this, man. I'm not, I'm not going to accept this. I'm not, I'm not born for this. Certainly God has to have more for me. And I came and I was like, dang, my soul. I don't know if you ever had that moment, but my soul just cried out, said, no, I'm not going to accept it. I'm not going to accept. I'm not born for this. I wasn't created for this. This is not what God has for me. Somewhere down the line, I messed up. Somewhere down the line, the story got off, off the track. I was not born for this environment. And I'm sure enough I'm not going to allow myself to die in that environment. And I'm going to do all that I can by the help of God to break through out of that environment. Because I believe that the kingdom of God has something more for me. And I, I, got up, I got up out of that moment. I got out of that moment frustrated, mad at the devil. But I made a commitment. I sure enough ain't dying in this environment. I ain't staying in this environment that too longer. I'm going to do what I have to do to get it done by the help and grace of God. I'm busting through. Listen, I believe that we all, some point in time, need to have that type of moment. Whether it's on the, whether it's on the curve outside of a bar, whether, whether it's right outside of a nightclub where you just explored the world and you said, this left me dry. 
or whether it's at home, on a couch in the middle of chaos, we all got to come to a place where we say, I was not born for this. God has something more for me. He has something more. He has life without death. He has goodness. He has his presence. He has no shame. He has order for my life. We all got to come to that moment. If you don't come to that moment, you're going to spin your wheels. You're going to keep going over and over. And your life is going to be sucked up out of you. And you're never going to live for the glory of God. I pray. I pray. If you have not had that moment, I pray that it happens soon. I pray that it happens soon. Let's bow our heads.